Let's remember the last time video games made crazy progress in graphics. It wasn't that long ago, a damn 21 years ago. I don't know how many of you played the first Far Cry, but when I played it for the first time, it just blew my mind. It was the most beautiful game of its time. Even now, if I show you a real photo of a tropical island and a screenshot from this game, you will not be able to tell the difference. But the most amazing thing was that the first Far Cry was actually the first game created on the Crytek engine. In other words, it was essentially just a test project, a trial run of a new engine by developers, the capabilities and features of which were still unknown. And yet, this engine was still able to produce a game that set a new graphical standard for shooters for years to come. But can we see something similar when it comes to modern engines? Unreal Engine has been around for many years. A lot of projects have been made on it, but developers still can't master it. Even five years after the release of this engine, we still get unoptimized games that don't work well even on top of the line PCs. Have developers really not learned how to create games on Unreal Engine 5 after all these years? Or is this a problem with all the modern engines and technologies? Why has the technical state of games deteriorated and why are we not seeing any graphical revolutions? And most importantly, why were developers able to do 15 years ago what modern developers are unable to do? Dr. Freeman, I presume. On November 19th, 2004, when Half-Life 2 was released on Steam, the server simply couldn't handle it. Hundreds of thousands of people tried to activate their copies at the same time. For Valve, this was not just a game release, but a test of an entire technical chain, which ended with the sale of the game through digital distribution and began with the creation of their own game engine. Source Engine looked like something from the future at the time. For the first time, physics, lighting, and animation worked not as separate systems, but as a single process. The well-known Havoc physics was not called by the engine. It was sewn into the render, so objects reacted not according to the script, but rather according to the real mass and momentum. That is why the physics in the game, for which Havoc was responsible, felt so progressive, smooth, and realistic. Even dynamic light affected dust particles, and the sky in Half-Life 2 was rendered as a separate layer that took into account atmospheric absorption. A small detail, but it did mark the beginning of the era of realistic global illumination. And, at the same time, the game ran smoothly on video cards that today would not even run Steam. Source was so flexible that Valve ended up using it for another 15 years. They used it to build Portal, Left 4 Dead, CSGO, and even Half-Life 3. The engine survived an entire era, simply because its architecture was originally designed for scaling and technical development of video games, not just marketing. A few years after the release of Half-Life 2, Crytek tried to repeat the explosive effect they got from the first Far Cry. At that time, the team developed their own engine just for demonstration purposes. CryEngine 1 was supposed to show that an open environment could look like a rendered level, but the result exceeded the goal. People bought the game not just for the plot or gameplay, but to test whether their PC could handle it, and because of the bright screenshots of a tropical island on the back of a disc box. After that, Crytek completely rewrote the engine, and in 2007, Crisis was released on CryEngine 2. This engine was the first to combine an automatic LOD system with streaming objects and textures, which allowed the engine to switch detail levels on its own without scripts. In simple terms, the same object in the game had several versions, a high polygon version for close distances and a simplified version for far distances. In Crisis, this process worked automatically for the first time. The engine calculated the distance to each object in the frame and replaced it with a model of the appropriate complexity in real time. This meant that the player could see tens of thousands of objects, trees, rocks, buildings, while maintaining a stable FPS. And yes, if it weren't for this system, Crisis would not have run on any of the top PCs of the time. As graphically advanced as this game was for its time, CryEngine made it possible. At the same time, it had dynamic texture streaming which freed up memory in real time as the player moved around the map. For 2007, this was unthinkable, so Crytek essentially implemented manual load management which allowed the game to remain playable. Well, almost. Water in this game also looks phenomenal. 
Meanwhile, Rockstar was working to prove the opposite, that an open world could be compact and stable rather than cumbersome. The renderware engine used in GTA 3, Vice City, and San Andreas was an invisible revolution. In it, the city was divided into hundreds of 64 by 64 meter sectors, and the engine only loaded those that were in the camera's field of view. That's why the player could drive through the entire city without a loading screen on 32 megabytes of RAM. For the PS2, it was almost magic. The same principle was adopted by Ubisoft and Bethesda, and it was with renderware that the era of the seamless world began. By the way, this engine was super versatile. It worked well on dozens of platforms and several generations, and the games created on it are still a pleasant memory of a warm childhood for most people. <laughs> These engines were not better than modern ones in the general sense. They simply worked according to a clear technical task and allowed games not only to function normally, but also to develop both technically and in terms of gameplay. Developers didn't just take the ready-make universal tools of these engines, but adapted them to different tasks and technical challenges, thereby constantly expanding the boundaries of what a video game can show a player. But Years go by and now everything looks a little different in the industry. How did engines created for progress turn into a barrier? Why do new games, instead of pushing the boundaries, often repeat the same technical mistakes? And most importantly, how did it happen that with more powerful hardware, we get less stable games? Today, it has become much easier for developers to release photorealistic bombs onto the market. And I mean literal bombs, so poorly optimized that your PC explodes. The latest releases have different authors, but a common problem. But you can't just say that Unreal 5 is a bad engine. Rather, it's a system that has grown to such a level of complexity that it's almost impossible to master. Engines used to be created for specific games or types of games, but now when the market is overflowing with studios and projects of varying complexity, something universal is needed and Epic has turned Unreal into a full-fledged ecosystem. Not just a tool, but rather an environment in which studios exist without even noticing that they have become a part of it. Unreal Engine doesn't just give studios technology, it takes away their very engineering instinct. Everything is too convenient. Modern developers don't need to build an LOD system because there's Nanite. They don't need to work with lighting because there's Lumen. They don't need to think about how to reduce the load because the engine will do everything itself, but it only does that in theory. In practice, everything breaks. The main technical reasons are real-time shader compilation, so-called traversal stutters, unoptimized new systems, and, most importantly, an architecture that still carries code from Unreal Engine 2. Even today, UE5 performs some simulations on a single processor core. Epic CEO Tim Sweeney publicly acknowledged this problem, saying, Many studios build games for top-of-the-line PCs and put off optimization for weaker ones until later. But he didn't mention the main thing. Epic itself created a culture where later became part of the design. When the engine grows faster than the industry can master it, the result is that everyone gets used to technical chaos. And this chaos is profitable. Every game on Unreal is another project tied to the Epic ecosystem. Studios receive grants, integrate Epic online services, I don't know, pay tribute to Epic Games, and ultimately become dependent on the chain built by one corporation. That's why in 2025, we see a new type of developer. Not an engineer, but simply a user of the engine. A person who doesn't create technology or even adapt it to their needs, but simply presses the enable nanite button. And when the game doesn't work well, developers don't look for a solution, but wait for a patch from Epic. But in my opinion, it's not just Unreal Engine that has degraded. I would also like to mention the former king of indie games, Unity. I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, every other person launched this engine with the desire to create their own indie game. Unity has always been the opposite of Unreal. Simple, open, with a low barrier to entry. Dozens of cult indie games were born on it. It was an engine for those who didn't have money, but had ideas. This was its strength. But over the years, everything changed. After going public, the company began to think not about technology, but about profit. And that's normal. I don't see anything wrong with that, but the way they did it was fatal. In 2023, when Unity announced a per install fee, developers had to pay for each installation, even for free games. For indie developers, this was a disaster. The reaction was immediate. Hundreds of studios openly declared that they were switching to other engines. It was the moment when, for the first time in many years, the industry realized that an engine is not just software, but a tool of control. 
Unity has long since canceled its rule that you have to pay for each installation, but everyone is already indifferent to this engine anyway. After all, Unity and Unreal are not competitors. They are two different manifestations of the same problem. We can see how this universality and monopoly negatively affect the entire gaming industry, but now we can see that there is another way, one that developers used 10 to 15 years ago. DICE stayed with Frostbite, and Battlefield 6 showed that a proprietary engine tailored to a specific specific goal can produce beautiful graphics with large-scale destruction of the entire map while delivering incredible optimization. The game literally runs at 60 FPS on a 10-year-old graphics card. One of the most beautiful games in terms of graphics this year was also created on the studio's internal engine. What Kojima did in DS2 with his Decima engine is literally impossible to do on Unreal. Super fast loading, stability, and graphics that are truly next gen. Decima is an example of good old fashioned, highly specialized engineering without attempts to adapt the engine to all possible scenarios. And in fact, I want to believe that in the future, developers and studios will return to their own engines more often, creating them for their own needs. I understand that this may be more difficult, but this complexity and painstaking work always translates into success.